All right, chapter 11. It's a pretty simple chapter as far as what is going on here. Um, we see basically the story of Athaliah, who was Ahaziah's mother. Remember, Ahaziah was killed by Jehu. And um, Athaliah comes in, and of course, she wants to reign. She wants to be queen and be reigning over um, Jerusalem. So she has um, all of Ahaziah's children killed, basically, is what happens. But one child escapes, one child is kept captive, not kept captive, but kept secret, and away from Athaliah, so she doesn't realize that he's still alive, and he's brought up by Jehoiada the priest, and um, when he becomes, I think, seven years old is when they, when they pronounce him to be the king, and they kill Athaliah. And that's, that's a the real brief overview of what happens in this chapter, pretty simple uh, chain of events. But let's dig into this. There's a few things that I want to point out and, and we're going to look at this evening um, in this chapter. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. So anyone who would have any claim to the throne, she killed. What an extremely wicked woman Athaliah is. I mean, can you imagine this? We just had my parents in visiting, you know, and they love their time getting to spend with their grandchildren. Well, here you have Athaliah, who is the mother of Ahaziah, killing all of her grandchildren. I mean, what, what type of a wicked woman cares more, so much about being in power that she's willing to destroy and to murder her own grandchildren? That's the type of woman that Athaliah was. And this is, you know, well, here, before I even get into that, I want to um, turn, if you would, to Micah chapter number 6. We're going to do a little bit of comparison also between 2 Chronicles 22 and 2 Kings 11. That's the parallel passage for these stories. In 2 Kings 22 verse 2, I'll just read this for you. The Bible says, 42 years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. He reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Athaliah the daughter of Amri. So Athaliah was Ahaziah's mother, and she's the daughter of Amri. Remember, at Zimri became king of Israel, and then Amri became king of Israel after Zimri died. And um, then you have Amri produced Ahab and Athaliah. And then in verse 3 it says, He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor, to do wickedly. And this is in reference to Ahaziah. Talk about Ahaziah being wicked. Why? Because his mother was his counselor. He was listening to what his mom said, and his mom was a wicked woman, so wicked that she's willing to kill her own grandchildren for power. And that's who Ahaziah looked up to. That's who Ahaziah went to when he, had, when, when he wanted to learn anything or know anything. That was his counselor. And we can see why Ahaziah was so wicked. Because, you know, you may be wondering why... Um, when, when we're reading through the passages and Jehu's killing, um, you know, the house of Israel, he's, he's killing the wicked kings, Ahab's seed, right? And cutting off the posterity of Ahab. Ahab was reigning over Israel. But then it's like Ahaziah is, is you know, the king of, of Jerusalem, the king of Judah gets caught up in the middle of it and then he gets killed and then everyone that's going to, to be killed friendly with Ahab's house, you know, they're all killed. It's kind of like, well, why did all those guys get killed? Why? Because they were all really, really wicked too. This was still the judgment of God coming against them. It wasn't just against Ahab's house. It was also against the house of Ahab's sister because that's who Athaliah was. It was Ahab's sister who married into the kings of Jerusalem. And Ahaziah ended up dying as a result. And it says, and, um, so Athaliah was a daughter of Amri, so was Ahab. Now, what does that say about Amri? Because the Bible doesn't talk a whole lot about Amri at all. There's very, very few places that his name even comes up. But obviously, if you produce children like Ahab and Athaliah, that speaks a lot for the father that's, that's raising those children, the father and mother who's raising those children. It's one thing to have one wicked child right? 
one that, that maybe just goes off the deep end where you say, you know what? You know, they rejected the Lord. I brought them up the best way, you know, whatever. And then one of them goes off the deep end. When you got two children, two siblings, and they're both wicked as hell, you got to look to the parents. Look to Amri. And Addie, turn to Micah chapter 6 because there's another reference to, to Amri in Micah chapter 6, proving my point exactly. We're going to start reading in verse number 13. So in Micah 6, you're, gonna, you're getting all of these um, curses, essentially, against the children of Israel and, and all these bad things being prophesied are going to happen to them. So we'll start reading in verse number 13. The Bible says, Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, in making thee desolate because of thy sins. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. And thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee. And thou shalt take hold, but shalt not deliver. And that which thou deliverest up will I, give, will, will, I, will I give up to the sword. Thou shalt sow, but shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil. And sweet wine, but shalt not drink wine. So he's saying all these things are going to happen. You know, you're going to be eating, but it's not going to satisfy you. It's not going to fill you up. You're going to be sowing, but you're not really going to reap because God's going to be cursing your crops. He says you're going to be treading the olives, but you're not going to be anointing yourself with the oil thereof because you're, you're pressing the olives. You're trying to get the oil out of it. And, and all, you know, you're going to be working at all this stuff, and it's not going to do you any good. Why? Because God's hand is going to be against you. And it says here why, specifically in verse number 16, why is all this stuff going to happen? For, which means because. Verse 16, for the statutes of Amri are kept. What's that? His laws, his, his testimonies, his statutes. The statutes of Amri are kept. And all the works of the house of Ahab, and ye walk in their counsels, that I should make thee a desolation, and the inhabitants thereof in hissing. Therefore ye shall bear the reproach of my people. The statutes of Amri. His, his wicked ways, bringing up these two wicked children that are, were murderers and murdered innocent people, and they just had a lust for power. It's wicked as hell. And now we see even more insight, as I mentioned already, to the destruction of not just Joram and Ahaziah, but almost his whole house. Because remember, when Ahaziah was killed, it wasn't just Ahaziah either. It was all these other members of his house that were going to, uh, to check up on Joram and, and everything else. So um, at the same time period, you have two wicked women on either side in Israel and in Judah. And you be between Jezebel and Athaliah, and they both had a lot of influence on their families. So this is a real dark time in the nation of Israel and Judah as a whole because you know, Judah was doing great for a while in Jerusalem with uh, Jehoshaphat and you know, Asa, Jehoshaphat. You have, you have these godly kings. And then it's like as soon as he married into that wicked household, things just deteriorated really quickly to the point to where, I mean, Athaliah is killing her grandchildren, killing anyone who might have right to the throne. Let's get back to 2 Kings chapter 11. Verse number two, the Bible says, But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain, and they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. So basically, Joash's aunt, right? because it's the sister of Ahaziah, hides Joash so that he doesn't get killed. Now we learn a little bit more info in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 22. You could turn there if you'd like. 2 Chronicles 22 is a, is, a, is a parallel passage for what we're reading here. And in verse 11 of that chapter, the Bible says, But Jehoshabeath, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons that were slain, and put him and his nurse in a bedchamber, right? So this is all exactly the same as what we just read. And then it says, So Jehoshabeath, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she slew him not. Now we get a little bit more information in this other chapter. We didn't see that in 2 Kings 11, but... Um, Jehoiada, because you're wondering, well, how did Jehoiada come to, ra to, to raise this child and, 
and everything else. It's because he was married to um, Joash's aunt. He was married to this Jehoshabeth, who was the sister of Ahaziah. So he's the good influence. This is, this is going to be the saving influence for the whole nation of Judah by, by raising up uh, Joash from a young age to try to get the whole, the whole country back on track. Look at verse number three now in 2 Kings 11. The Bible says, And he was, hid, he was with her hid in the house of the Lord six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. For, so for the six years that this infant was growing up and being taught and raised, Athaliah is just ruling because there's no more claim to the throne because she, she thought she killed everybody. But all of the other brethren were dead that could have um, made any claim to the throne. So verse number four says, In the seventh year... Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds with the captains and the guard and brought them to him into the house of the Lord and made a covenant with them and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, saying, This is the thing that ye shall do. A third part of you that enter in on the Sabbath shall even be keepers of the watch of the king's house. And a third part shall be at the gate of Sir and a third part at the gate behind the guard. So shall ye keep the watch of the house that it be not broken down. And two parts of all, you, of all you that go forth on the Sabbath, even they shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord about the king. And ye shall compass the king round about, every man with his weapons in his hand. And he that cometh within the ranges, let him be slain. And be ye with the king as he goeth out and as he cometh in. And the captains over hundreds did according to all things that Jehoiada the priest, the priest commanded. And they took every man his men that were to come in on the Sabbath with them that should go out on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. So we see here, after seven years now, the child's seven years old, Jehoiada decides to show other people because they've been secretly just raising this child, bringing him up. And now, you know, in the seventh year, after all this stuff has happened, he decides to show some of the soldiers, the captains of the guard, people who are in pretty high positions within, within the kingdom, but also people who you figure are going to have their loyalty still to the king, to the rightful king. When you have a wicked person like Athaliah, the only way that they maintain their power is going to be through fear. It's not because people love this woman. She's a wicked demon of a person. Nobody wants to be ruled over by a person like that. But the reason why they allow is just for fear because they think that she, you know, she has power and she's going to, you know, if anyone speaks up, that's going to be your life. But when they see here and out, they see here, oh, wow, there's still another heir. Yeah, everyone's going to want that person to be king over Athaliah. They're going to let their loyalties still lie to the, to the line of Ahaziah, to the line of the house of David, instead of this wicked woman ruling after him. Verse number 10 says, so basically what they do is they, they you know, Jehoiada just kind of commands them and says, look, we need you guys watching over the house of God, watching over the king, you know, in all these areas, and, and designates the areas that they're going to be um, responsible for prote ultimately protecting the king. That was their job is to make sure, say, hey, look, the king's alive. Athaliah killed everyone else, so we need to make sure that he stays alive. They're like the Secret Service, right, in, in today's lingo. That's, that's what they're doing. Their, their job is to take, to take a bullet, as it were, for the king and, and to watch over and to protect him, make sure he stays safe. Verse number 10 says, And to the captains over hundreds did the priest give King David's spears and shields that were in the temple of the Lord. Now, these are captains of the guards. These are captains over hundreds. Do you think that they didn't have any weapons? Of course they had weapons. What he's doing here is very symbolic. What he's doing here is showing them, hey, we're going back to the ways of King David. We're getting back to our roots. We're, this is the line of David. We're going we're gonna to sustain this line, this kingly line. And we're going to make this king the rightful king and get Athaliah out of here. And we're going to go back to David's way. So he gives them David's spears and David's shields. So they're armed day in, day out when, when they have their weapons in their hands and they're guarding, they're reminded, yes, we're going back to the ways of David. 
That's why he did that. They had their own swords. You, you guarantee it. They're, they're captains over, over the guard. They had weapons. But they got these weapons specifically to remind them of what they're doing. There's a lot of hope in this young boy and having been raised in the house of the Lord to get the kingdom back to God. And, and once he finally shows these guards this, this, uh, you know, this boy, I think that probably encouraged everyone around him to now have hope into, into getting things back to the way that they ought to have been in the be, uh, to begin with. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And the guards stood every man with his weapons in his hand round about the king from the right corner of the temple to the left corner of the temple, along by the altar and, by, and the temple. And he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. So everyone was real happy about this. They're celebrating. They, they put the crown on his head. And they say, God saved the king. And they not only put the crown upon his head, don't pass over this, and gave him the testimony. It's the testimony of the Lord. It's, it's God's word. They gave him the testimony. This is, this is the way that he was to rule. Jehoiada was the priest. He's been raising this child up in the words of the Lord and basically trying to get him back to say, you need to be putting God first. You need to be worshiping the Lord because you remember not that long ago, there was all this Baal worship going on and Jehu was getting rid of Baal out of the land. When, you know, last week we just read about that, how he killed all these prophets of Baal. And, um, but now it's like a big reset button has been pushed. All these wicked people are dying off and now we're going to start back out right again with this young king. Now, this was a very bold act for them to do. Because think of the repercussions at this time is that you have this wicked woman who was not afraid to kill her own grandchildren. That sends a really powerful message to people when you're dealing with someone who's willing to do anything for them to stay in power. This is like the demonic people that are in government today that are willing to kill people, willing to do whatever to retain their power. And, and basically what they're saying is, you better not cross me. You better not cross my path, right? It's, it's a threat to try to keep the people in fear. That's what Athaliah was doing. He's saying, you think I won't kill you? I killed my own grandchildren. So by making this proclamation and saying, God save the king, that took some guts. That took some boldness because any one of those guys could have been a little snake and, and you know, turned in. Joey said, hey, Athaliah, one of these guys, you know, one of them survived and he's alive and could have ratted him out, yep. right? And that would have been the, the, the obviously, the, the rat thing to do, but it would have been a little bit easier for people who had fear. If you're fearful of Athaliah and say, oh, man, there's no way that we can, you know, that this is going to go down well, and you were afraid, you'd, you'd run to Athali, you'd run to Satan. But no, they had boldness. They knew that this was right, and they acted on that faith. And um, obviously, there's a huge risk involved. But look at all of the risks that men of God have been taking throughout the Bible. We have all these great stories in God's Word to take encouragement from. The Christian life is not supposed to be a cowardly life. And this is really what we need to remember. I think this is going to be the main point of my sermon tonight is that we need to make sure that our life is not marked by cowardice when it comes to our faith, but that we're willing to be bold. We're willing to make a stand. We're willing to actually say something and stand for the word of God and not just cower down and not just let the wicked get more wicked and continue to just push the moral direction of our community, of our country, of, of the whole world down into the pits of hell. Amen. But that we're going to stand up and say, no, we're going to say, we're not, we're, we've had it with this. We're not going to be tolerant. We're not going to sit by. We're not going to let you destroy everything around us. We're going to call sin, sin. We're going to call wickedness, wickedness. And we're going to stand for righteousness. And we're going to stand for the word of God. And I don't care if you don't like it. I don't care if you're going to make fun of it. But you know what? We're going to stand here and proclaim it. And we're not going to back down. 
It's time to stop being so complacent and tolerant of every vile thing that happens. We've been taught and brainwashed into thinking that, well, that's just what they think. Oh, well, you know, live and let live. Everyone just um, sit idly by and let the world go to hell. We're just taught to just accept all this garbage. And we need to get over that. Overcome that, that the fear, for one, of not standing up and saying anything. And two, the conditioning and the brainwashing into tolerating everything. You ought to speak your mind. You know, when you're out and you see some faggot, some sodomite out there acting all girly and stupid, and they're checking you out, you say, what the hell is the matter with you? You ought to speak your mind and not, and not allow us and, and, and say, oh, I can't believe you'd say that. You bet I'm going to say that. Why? Because I don't want my children growing up and thinking that's normal. And thinking that we're just not going to say anything about all this perversion and wickedness that's going on. No, we're going to call it out. We're not going to stand for it. Amen. You know, there's some things that you just, you deal with because you're in the world. But you, you know what? You got to have a line in the sand that you're going to draw. Yep. Are you going to allow for just Satan altars to be reared up in town? Because I'll tell you what, I'm not. Someone comes to our town and wants to rear up an altar unto Satan. Guess what's going to happen? I'm going to be tearing that sucker down. Oh, but it's a private problem. I don't care. Because if you're going to live the Christian life, look at what the people did in the Bible. Look at what Gideon did. He tore down the altar of Baal. God told him to do it. It didn't matter that the property didn't belong to him. Look what Jehu did. Look at what they did in Book of Acts. Look at, look at Acts chapter number 4. Turn if you want to Acts chapter number 4. You've got to have a line where you're going to say enough is enough. We're not just going to sit by and let wickedness rule and take over. Now, obviously, the number one thing that we need to be using is our voice. That is, the, that is the primary and, and, and almost, I want to say, exclusively the only way to resist the wickedness. But that ought to be the, the, the way that we're focusing on. Because we don't have any, I can't think of any instances going on right now that would physically require to go and do something at the moment. But um, we definitely need to be um, preaching and being vocal and very loud against the things that are going on. And we're not going to stand and take it. And we're not going to just allow perversion to walk up and down the streets and we're just okay with that. Because they're not okay with that. Look at Acts chapter 4. We need boldness. We see the boldness that the disciples received in Acts chapter 4. Uh, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, And they laid hands on them and put them in hold un unto the next day, for it was now eventide. So, this is talking about uh, these people preaching God's word, being, having hands laid on them, and they were put in hold. Basically, they were put into prison until the next day. They were locked up for a day. Look at verse number six. The Bible says, And Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. So here we are in Jerusalem with Peter and these other disciples. They get hands laid on them. They're thrown into prison. And now they're brought before all these rulers. The bigwigs. I mean, the, the, the guys calling the shots, right? People who you might have a little bit of fear towards because they're ruling the land and they have power over putting you in a prison or you know, punishing you or whatever, whatever they want to do. And they're, in front, they're gathered now in front of basically the kindred or the household of the high priest. This is the, the, the religious... Let's see, and in these days, the religious leaders, the high priest, they also had some political influence as well. They were also kind of rulers over the area, but they were still subservient to the Roman Empire. But they were, they were rulers of the area in a sense, even though they were high priests, it was kind of mixed together. But anyhow, let's keep reading in this story. So they get brought before all these rulers. Verse number seven says, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power 
Or by what name have you done this? So they're being called out now for preaching, for preaching about Jesus and for healing. And uh, verse number 8 says, Then Peter, don't miss it, says, Filled with the Holy Ghost. So he's filled with God's Holy Ghost, with God's Holy Spirit. And as a result of this, he has the boldness. He says, and said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, so now he names, say, well, what power are you doing this under? Who is it that, that, that told you to do this? What, what name are you acting under by doing this? He said, by the name of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't even just stop there. He comes straight out and says, hey, we believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And by his name and his power, we're doing this. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, whom ye crucified. Yeah, you wicked people. Hey, I'm doing this under the authority of Jesus Christ who you crucified. You nailed him to the cross. You murderers killed Jesus Christ whom God raised from the dead. Even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Now he knew they didn't want to hear that. They wanted him to come up with any other reason. They're trying to intimidate him. They're trying to scare him and to stop and to preach and teach about Jesus Christ. So they ask him, well, who are you doing this by? Just to push him and to see if they can scare him into not saying Jesus Christ. But what does he do? He gets filled with the Holy Ghost and he goes, he goes right back at him and saying, no, we are doing this under the authority of Jesus Christ and you're the murderers that killed him. Amen. Verse number 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. So they're astonished because they're looking at Peter and John. And they're looking at the boldness with which they're speaking against the priests, the high priests. Say, wow, these guys are bold. And what was amazing to them is not as much that they were bold against the priests is that they were unlearned men. They were not Pharisees. They were not brought up in these schools. They were fishermen. They were blue-collar workers. Don't think that you need to have some degree in theology in order to combat the spiritual wickedness and these priests who think they know everything about God when you combat them with the truth. You can have the boldness of Peter and John without having that type of background. You don't need that. All you need is Jesus Christ and the truth, Holy Ghost, to give you the boldness. And it says, they marveled, and it says, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Are you lacking boldness in your life? Are there times when you're just afraid to speak? Are there times when, when you, know, you see all this wickedness going on and you don't want to say anything about it because you're getting scared? Well, you know what you need? You need to be with Jesus a little bit more. You need to get in the Word a little bit more. You need to pray a little bit more. And you need to just rely on Jesus Christ and have the boldness. Hey, look, because you know why? It's not your opinion. It's the Word of God. If you are relying on the Word of God, if you are preaching the Word of God, you know it's God's Word. What do you have to be ashamed of? Nothing. There's no reason not to have boldness. There's no reason not to proclaim it. Being with Jesus will give you boldness, not cowardice. You get a bunch of Christians today that are acting like cowards and not willing to stand up against the sodomite agenda, which you can't really get much more wicked than that because they're a bunch of perverts and pedophiles that are out defiling people and they're full of murder. They're full of envy and debate and deceit and malignity and they're whisperers and backbiters and haters of God. What more type of an enemy do you need to be able to stand up against? But no, you want to coddle them. No, you want to invite them into your church to be among your children. Cowards. Get some boldness. Spend some time with Jesus in his word. Jump down to verse number 29. Again, this chapter is just marked with boldness. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Because they're threatening them. They're, they're, they're beating them up and threatening them to stop preaching the name of Jesus. So they go to God. 
God, we're being threatened. God, they're intimidating us. God, they're doing all this stuff to try to stop the work that we're doing for you. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Hey, pray to God that God will give you that boldness, that God will fill you with the Spirit. Hey, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Start walking in God's Word and you will get that boldness. Pray to God for that boldness. Say, look, this isn't easy because we have all these people opposing us. God, give me some more boldness. Amen. And when He gives you that boldness, you will not be silent. Amen. You're going to preach out and stand up against the filth of this world. Verse 30, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And look what happened. And they spake the word of God with boldness. When you see throughout the Bible, especially in the book of Acts, the Holy Ghost coming upon people, you know what you're going to see happening? The work for God being done boldly, Amen. boldly, out in the open, very vocally, not, not writing a little letter and passing it off to someone or being anonymous in what you believe. No, boldness, standing up and saying, this is the truth, proclaiming it from the rooftops, not hiding it under a bushel. Not staying in your closet. The Bible says, you know, what you hear in the closet, that, that preach you upon the rooftops. That's the boldness that we need. And we've been conditioned to be tolerant and that we should just keep things to ourselves and not to, don't talk about religion. That might offend somebody. Why well, am I going to talk about religion? Because it's God's word. And we're going to proclaim God's word boldly. I'm not just going to go along and get along. I'm not just going to, oh, don't rock the boat. Amen. I'm going to be rocking the boat. People need a, a, a slap in the face with the word of God. Yes. In, the, in the society, the, the perverted society we live in today, people just need a, swip, a quick slap in the face with God's word. Proverbially speaking, of course, not not with the book itself. Some people, that might be the only thing that gets through to them, but no, I, I'm sick and tired. And, and you know, one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why there's not a lot of people even doing this, it's not because it's hard. Because when you have the boldness of God, it's not hard. It's because they're not getting the boldness because they're not doing the work of Jesus, because they're not going up and getting off their rear ends and doing the work that God has for them to do. The people are not going out soul winning. They're not spending serious time in their Bibles, reading and learning and studying and meditating on the Word of God, going out and doing the work and keeping themselves unspotted from the world. If you're doing those things, you're going to be walking in the Spirit. And if you're walking in the Spirit, you will have boldness, guaranteed. Just like Jesus Christ said, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. If you're not a fisher of men, you are not following Jesus. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. If you are not a fisher of men, you are not following Jesus Christ. And if you're a coward, when it comes to the things of God, you're not walking in the Spirit. If you're filled with the Spirit, you'd be filled with boldness to preach God's Word. It's a bottom line. Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 11. It's going to be a shorter sermon tonight. We're going to finish up 2 Kings chapter 11, verse number 13. So they had just pronounced Joash to be king. Seven years later, he had been hidden from Athaliah. Athaliah has been reigning for these six years. And now they put the crown on his head and they give him the testimony and he's king. And, and you've got these captains of the guard saying, you know, God save the king. And everyone's happy and everyone's rejoicing about this. Well, Athaliah catches wind of this in verse number 13. The Bible says, and when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manner was. And the princes and the trumpeters by the king and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets. And Athaliah rent her clothes and cried, Treason, treason. So she's all upset and she's like, oh, you're committing treason. No, Athaliah, you wicked woman. 
This is the rightful heir to the throne. You're the one that usurped authority over man and just in general in the kingdom and, and, and killed with murderous hands those that were more worthy than you. They're not committing treason, but she, she tries to just kind of grasp on to one last hope that someone's going to listen to her. But notice, there is no power given to her. And power is interesting like that. Power is, is more of a perception than anything else in general. Now, there's times where people can physically threaten you with violence or you know, hold a gun to your head and have some limited form of power in, in some regards. But ultimately, when it comes to governments and when it comes to rulers, look how easy it was to, to, to strip her of her power. She had power just because she was ruling and telling the armies what to do. She had the captains of the guards to be able to, to tell, to, to, hey, go take care of, oh, this person's speaking up, take care of that person for me. But what happens when no one listens to her? There's no more power. She's not in charge. You're only in charge if people listen to you. Remember that. Because don't ever let the excuse come your way that, oh, well, I was told to do this if it's something that's wicked. I mean, do you mean to, do you really think that Athaliah personally, individually killed every single one of Ahaziah's children? Because I don't. Of course not. What she's responsible for it because she sent people out to do it. But what if nobody did it? She wouldn't be reigning. She would have no power because no one would be listening to her. Verse number 15, the Bible says, But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the host, and said unto them, Have her forth without the ranges. See, look, and now we have Jehoiada commanding for her to be, he doesn't do it himself, but he has people listening to him. Why? Because now he's taken over a lot of that, that, that authority and that power. And people are looking to him to lead. Because obviously, when you have a seven-year-old king, <laughs> he's only going to be leading to a very, very, very small degree. He's still a child. But Jehoiada was the one who kept him. Jehoiada was the one who was raising him. Jehoiada was his counselor. So he's the one who brought him out. But Jehoiada is the one that, that for a while people are going to have the respect to and be listening to as the co-regent you know, while he's bringing up this, this child to take over the kingdom. So Jehoiada is basically in charge now. And it makes a lot of sense why people would, would, would follow him because he saved one of the king's sons you know, and, and was, was going to bring them back to the right way. So uh, verse 15 says, But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the host, and said unto them, Have her forth without the ranges, and him that followeth her kill with the sword. For the priest had said, Let her not be slain in the house of the Lord. And they laid hands on her. And she went by the way by the which the horses came into the king's house and there was she slain. So he didn't want her killed in like in church, you know, like in God's house, in the house of the Lord. So he says, well, take her out of here. And anyone who's following after her, right, anyone who's serving her, anyone who follows after Athaliah, kill them also. But go out there and do it. And that's what they do. And they take her and bring her out there. And then verse 17 says, And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and and the king and the people, that they should be the Lord's people, between the king also and the people. So at this moment, Jehoiada's like, all right, we're going to get this settled right now. We're going to make a covenant. A covenant's like an agreement or a contract or a promise, right? This is what, what a covenant is. He says, we are going to make a covenant with the Lord right now between the Lord, this king, and all of us people, we are going to be the Lord's people. We are going to serve the Lord. We are going to follow the laws of the Lord. And getting them back on track. This was, this was Jehoiada's, and it says in verse 18, And all the people of the land went into the house of Baal and break it down. This is a great turning point. You know what? Sometimes these things need to happen. And, it's, and this same type of thing has happened multiple times in the Bible. Where you go, choose you this day whom you will serve. You have to get to a decision point. Elijah said, you know, hey, choose you. You know, who is God? 
Who are you going to serve? Is it going to be Baal or is it going to be the Lord? You make that decision, you make that choice, and you go with it. And Jehoiada then brought up this, this choice and brought it to a head again, saying you need to choose who you're going to serve. And sometimes people today, Christians today, need to decide, hey, who are you going to be loyal to? Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the money of this world? Are you going to serve Satan? Or are you going to serve God? Right. And if you're going to serve God, hey, get all in. Serve the Lord with all your heart. Amen. When you decide, hey, I'm going to serve the Lord, you know what we're going to do? We're going to be breaking down the house of Baal. You know what we're going to do? We're going to be going home. We're going to be getting idols out of our house. We're going to be cleaning up our lives, and we're going to be living a sold-out life to the Lord, making His covenant, His promise. Hey, God, you're our God, and we're going to be your people, which means we're going to treat your word with respect, and we are going to not just say with our lips that we believe it, but we're actually going to do something about it, not be some hypocritical believers that says with their mouth and does something completely different. And all the people of the land went into the house of Baal and break it down. His altars and his images break they in pieces thoroughly and slew Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars and the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. You know, it usually only takes one or two guys to stand up to encourage an entire multitude to do what's right. Don't be the guy just waiting for someone else to stand up to say or to do something and just always looking for someone else. You know there are situations that come up that you are uncomfortable, you don't think this is right, but you're afraid to stand up and say anything about it. And if someone else were to stand up and say, hey, that's wrong, You'd be right up there going, yeah, that's wrong, you know, standing up there with them. Don't wait for someone else. You be that person. You stand up and say, I don't care if no one stands up with me. We're going to stand up against this. I'm going to stand up against this. And in so doing, you will encourage other people. You will get other people to stand up with you. It takes boldness, though, because you're going to have to be the first one to do it. You're going to be after the one that just chooses to say, you know what, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to have the boldness to do this. I mean, this is what happened when Jehoiada said, you know what? We're deciding right now. We're choosing the Lord. We're making a covenant. God, we're going to serve you. And as soon as he did that, he made the bold stance. He's the one that showed Joash to the people and said, hey, now we've got the king. Let's anoint him king and we're going to follow the Lord. As soon as he stood up and did that, and then Athaliah, the wicked queen, was, was killed, then all of a sudden, all of these people are filled with the courage to go out and tear down the house of Baal and to slay Matan and, you know, and to do all these great things. Jehoiada didn't even have to command them anymore. Why? Because they were all encouraged and then they all got on board. But it took the leadership of Jehoiada to do that. It took that one person or two people or a few people to stand up and actually resist and actually resist the wicked Athaliah and not be afraid, but be bold enough to stand up and stand your ground. And we need more of that today. We need people willing to stand up and not wait to just follow someone. Look, following is great. Leaders need followers. But you know what? We need more leaders. Every area, every community needs someone to just say, enough is enough. I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to wait for someone else to get the job done. Verse number 19, and he took the rulers over hundreds and the captains and the guard and all the people of the land, and they brought down the king from the house of the Lord and came by the way of the gate of the guard to the king's house, and he sat on the throne of the kings, and all the people of the land rejoiced. And the city was in quiet and they slew Athaliah with the sword beside the king's house. Seven years old was Jehoash when he began to reign. And, you know, in Proverbs, I don't have this referenced or memorized, but basically that um, when it talks about when the wicked rule, right, the people, the people are, are, you know, they're not happy, but when the, when the righteous rule, then... Um, you know, then there's peace and, and, and these types of things. And, and I'm totally butchering that. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't have the, the verse memorized. But we see that happening here. We see now we finally, you know, the people are getting right. And then what happens? Now there's finally some peace coming. There's rest. Why? Because they decided to follow the Lord. 
all these, I mean, all this turmoil and problems and conspiracies and people being killed. It's all a result of their wickedness and their sin. I mean, none of that would have happened if, if, if one of the predecessors to Joash actually just stood for the Lord and didn't let these wicked women influence their lives so much and said, no, we're going to do what's right. <clears throat> but let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, for these stories in the Bible. God, I pray that you would please embolden us Fill us with the Holy Ghost and with your Spirit, dear Lord. Embolden us to go preach your word. Embolden us to go approach people to get them saved, dear Lord. Embolden us to stand up against the wickedness of this world, to not just let things continue to happen the way they are. God, I don't care. I mean, if, if you know, all the attacks come against us, Lord, help us not to become cowards and back down if one day maybe our, our names do appear in the spotlight because... The, the wicked workers of darkness want to silence our voice and, and tell us not to teach and preach in the name of Jesus Christ and not to, not to stand for what your word says, but try to shame us, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just give us the strength to stand firm and that you would uh, fill us with your Holy Ghost and with your power, dear Lord, that we can never, ever back down on, on the truth, but that we would boldly proclaim your words. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.